Hi, this is Jeff Warner, a volunteer with the University of California Master Gardeners of Los Angeles County. This is a recording of the Garden in Place workshop that was presented live on May 19th, 2020. We cover three topics in this workshop. First, we hear from Master Gardener Marty Lindsay about how, why, and when to thin vegetable seedlings. Then I'll talk about a debilitating disease affecting citrus trees in Southern California called Wong Wong Bing, or citrus greening disease, that is being spread by an invasive insect, the Asian citrus psyllid. Finally, Master Gardener Daniela Roveda will cover the principles of composting, how to turn kitchen scraps and yard waste into a terrific soil amendment. I hope you enjoy this Garden in Place workshop. For other workshops and gardening videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. As you're wandering in and, and coming in slowly through the miracle of electronics, I wanted to let you know that you are muted and we will be keeping folks that way for the sake of everybody to hear. My name is Roger Gray. I'm a Master Gardener volunteer with the University of California uh, Agricultural and Natural Resources Division, uh, the Cooperative Extension. And we're presenting these Garden in Place workshops every week during the current uh, virus emergency, and we will be continuing, we think, for some time. But we're going to start off with uh, Master Gardener Marty Lindsay. We're going to start off with uh, a little bit of thinning. Marty? Hello. Um, as Roger mentioned, I'm Marty Lindsay. I'm a Master Gardener, um, Northwestern Los Angeles County. So my uh, micro is a little bit different, but I think that the um, techniques are pretty similar. So Roger, can you start by running my video? Hi, I'm Marty Lindsay, a Los Angeles County Master Gardener coming to you from Northwest Los Angeles County. I'm gonna to talk to you today about thinning, which is something that is personally very hard for me because I feel like if I planted a seed and it grew, it should be able to grow. But why we thin is that we want there to be enough space for all of the plants to make it and to get the nutrients and get the space to be successful. So a couple of weeks ago, I planted this fennel. And you can tell I planted it in a row. These guys have plenty of room. These guys have plenty of room, but these are all bunched together. So I'm gonna have to take some of this out. There's two ways I can do it. I can just pull it out by the roots. Or another way that I can do it is I can, I can take a pair of scissors and I can just cut it. And you can see how I just, I just cut it so that there's none at the, there's none there anymore. I think I'm going to take this one out too. So now these might be a little bit too close together. I might have to reevaluate that later, but you can see now these all have the space that they need to grow. And I can put this in a salad or eat it, um, eat it as microgreens. These right here are beets. And I don't think I'm quite ready to thin these. Um, I'm going to probably come out later this week or next week and address the beets. Uh, the turnips are an entirely different um, animal, and I will do another video on those. But if you look, here are the leeks. And the leeks are going to have to be thin too. And again, when I come out to th when I come out and next week to thin the beets, I'll thin the leeks, and it'll be time for them. Thank you very much. Just to kind of re review, why we want to then seedlings is we want everything to survive. We want everything to thrive. And when you thin, you give enough nutrients, enough sunlight and enough airflow for the plants to be successful. So the bulbing fennel is the one that I used and it recommends that the plants are four inches apart. Sometimes I'll go a little bit closer to Together because I live in a very extreme climate. For example, our low last night was 42 and our high today is going to be in high 70s. And so when you have extreme temperatures and you have wind and, you know, dry, dry climate, you kind of want to have things a little bit closer together than or someplace that has a more moderate climate like on the coast. Um, I don't know if you can see this. I'm going very low tech. This is a picture of that same garden this morning. So you can see the, the fennel is like four inches apart. Um, I don't, I'm not getting any feedback, so I don't know if I'm on. Just, do people have questions? I think that's pretty much it. There's a, there's a question uh, from a Julie Smith uh, asking if you're in the Antelope Valley, 
do you have a wind block for your garden? Yes, I am in the Antelope Valley and that particular do not have a wind block for and if, I don't know if you could see how um, wide open everything was. What helps when you're in this kind of an extreme climate is to go ahead and just plant your um, your plants very um, densely together and the plants will protect each other. Um, I do have a windbreak for one of my other gardens, but that the garden that I was in is my year round garden that I have raised beds for. But yeah, a wind, if you have a windbreak, use it. Cool. Um, yeah, there's nothing, uh, nothing like a constant, steady, strong wind to, uh, to mess with how your uh, plants want to grow and not to mention put a little bit of extra stress on the uh, watering issues as well. All right. Um, well, we and, a good point, and another good point about like being in the Ant Valley is that I tend to plant as much as possible from seed because the, the things that you'll buy um, in a nursery are grown in either a greenhouse or someplace coastal. And so when you bring it up to um, a more extreme climate, they don't have as good of a chance of making it. But if you plant something in from seed in an extreme climate, the chances that are gonna, that it's gonna make it are a lot greater. You just have to be more patient. You've got to start sooner. Awesome, absolutely, thank you. And again, you know, it's tough to, to want to kill something that has been growing um, and, and you actually got the seed to sprout. But um, as you point out, if they're too crowded, they will do strange things to each other. Um, in our school garden, we found a couple of carrots that grew too close together. They literally twined on each other uh, like a spiral and we couldn't yeah. pull them apart. <laughs> All right. If you're like most Californians, you have a citrus tree or two in your yard. Oranges, lemons, limes, Australian finger limes, maybe. Uh, or you know somebody with a citrus tree in their yard. Or you just like to eat the stuff. You need to listen very carefully to our next presenter. Jeff Warner is going to tell us all about HLB, a thing that is trying to destroy your citrus trees. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk today about a insect called the Asian citrus psyllid and the disease it carries called Wong Long Bing or citrus greening disease. Uh, besides being a Master Gardener volunteer, I also work for the Master Gardener office because we have a grant to, uh, to take this information out to the public. And uh, our grant has about another six months to run, but we're trying to promote not just you know, we're going to educate you about the, the insect and disease, but also encourage you to consider alternatives to citrus if you're planting new fruit trees. So uh, when I say citrus, I mean everything that you can think of that is related to citrus, oranges, lemons, limes, kumquats, finger limes, if you're lucky enough to have that new one. Uh, and it's really important that uh, California residents understand this because about half the citrus trees in California uh, or in backyards and the other half are commercial citrus uh, with about 60% of Californians having citrus in their yard. In Southern California, the, the uh, percentage is even higher. So this is the disease and in the insect. Um, some of this material comes from uh, our, our um, advisor on this project, uh, Beth Graston Cardwell. So we'll show you some of the stuff that she has put together as well as mine. So the psylla is a very small insect. It's about the size of an aphid, if you're familiar with getting aphids on all sorts of plants. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a flying insect in adult form. And uh, you can easily identify it because it's, it, when it's feeding, it has its head down and tail end up. Uh, but you can see it's very small, so you might, need, you might need a magnifier. If you look at the, you know, the fingertip there compared to the size of the insect, it's pretty small. Uh, with a little 10x mi magnifier, you can make out the details pretty well. Uh, here's just showing a diagram of it. Uh, the eggs are only about a third or a quarter of a millimeter. They're really tiny. Uh, then, then they hatch. They go through these five nymphal stages uh, before they become adult. It takes between two and seven weeks to go from an egg to an adult. Depends on the temperature. All insects, their rate of development is temperature dependent. 
So when we're looking for the insects, we're going to be uh, looking, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, you might see a cluster of them. I, you know, I found some on my uh, orange tree this year for the first time. And I only found about three throughout the whole canopy, three adults, and they're in the process of laying eggs. Um, but uh, so I've never seen this sort of cluster here. That's, that, that would be much easier to identify than finding a few, you know, lone psyllids in your tree. But again, you can see they, they feed in that angle, they have red eyes, and, uh, and, and you can sort of see through the, the, the wings in the back if you're looking carefully. Now you're mostly going to see them at the time of year when the citrus is producing what they call feather flush. This is the brand new growth on the citrus, the new leaves. Uh, and it's the place where they always lay their eggs, down into the little, you know, you'll see them kind of tucked down in there if you look carefully. And they do this because the young cannot eat anything except uh, young leaves. They can't eat the fully mature, hardened off leaves. The adults can feed from those, but the, the, the nymphs cannot. And so they have to, you're only gonna see them in numbers when they have new flush in their trees, which it can vary, you know, we, we normally have one big flush in the late winter, early spring, uh, but in California with our variable weather, we can see flushing uh, other times of year as well. So we do have to keep, keep an eye out for this. Now the young are also easy to identify because they're very, very distinctive looking as well. They're flattened with red eyes and they, they produce honeydew like aphids and scale insects do, but they do it in a unique way. They actually encapsulate the honeydew in uh, these waxy tubules. And so you'll, you might see these little tubules hanging from your leaves and that's, a, that's an indication of, of the psyllid, the Asian citrus psyllid. No other insect uh, in our area at least does anything like this. You know, that honeydew is, uh, is it's basically insects that excrete honeydew do it because uh, there's too much sugar in the sap that they're feeding on. They're trying to get the proteins out of the, out of the tree sap and then all that extra sugar has to go somewhere so they excrete it out the back end. So the insects themselves do a little bit of damage because they're feeding on the, on the plants just like an aphid would. They're sucking the juices. Uh, they also inject a little bit of a salivary toxin uh, which can cause the leaves to curl and pinch in pictures here. And the really small leaves, the tips may just turn brown and break right off. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's a problem, but it's not a huge problem. Uh, if it wasn't for the disease, we really wouldn't be talking about this insect. It's, you, know, it's, you probably have more serious damage from leaf miners on your citrus than you're going to see from the, psyllid, from the direct damage. So we're talking about it because of the bacteria uh, that uh, Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus, if you want to <laughs> pronounce it, uh, that, they, that the, uh, the psyllid carries. Now both the psyllid and the bacteria are, are, you know, are invasive uh, pests from, uh, from Asia. And uh, the disease is officially called Wang Long Bing, which in Chinese translates to yellow shoot disease or even yellow dragon disease, which is much more dramatic. I like the sound of that one. But initially in the United States, we called it citrus greening disease. And I'll show you why in just a second. So the first symptoms that are gonna appear if, if you have an infection of the bacteria. So the insect will feed on the leaves uh, both adults and the nymphs, if they happen to have the bacteria, which they've picked up from another plant, uh, they'll inject it through the saliva into the, leaf, into the leaf, and it starts spreading very slowly through the phloem, which is the, uh, one of the vascular systems in a, in a plant. Uh, it's the one that carries the sap. And uh, it, you'll start seeing leaf symptoms first. And it's, it's the, you see these sort of blotchy, they call it blotchy model. Uh, it can look like a lot of other types of citrus deficiencies, uh, nutritional deficiencies, like the one at the bottom is a zinc deficiency. Uh, but citrus are heavy feeders, they use a lot of nitrogen, and so they very often have, you know, chlorotic, chlorotic yellow leaves because of low nitrogen or because of other micronutrients that they're missing like iron or manganese or magnesium. So it's, it's not unusual to have, you know, blotchy looking <laughs> yellow leaves. The difference here is that the, the symptoms on this case are asymmetrical. If you're looking at a leaf, the left and right side are not going to look the same. You know, they're going to be, and the yellowing crosses the vein lines, whereas most diseases, like you can see in the zinc there, it tends to be defined by the veins. It's either, it's either, it's usually between the veins. 
but this one long bing is different in that way. Uh, if you flip a leaf over, you might see some thickened uh, um, uh, veins. They call this corky veins. It's another symptom that you won't see with a nutritional deficiency. Um, but it's also can be difficult because different types of citrus express the problem differently. Uh, so you really need an expert to determine if you have it at that stage. Uh, as it develops, uh, the fruit stops uh, coloring up properly. This is why it was called uh, citrus greening disease. An orange will stay green at the bottom, uh, you know, and, and never fully colors properly. And it gets worse than that. As, as, it, as the disease progresses, uh, the fruit becomes lopsided, uh, smaller, they drop early, and the fruit becomes bitter at that point. So at that point, you have a tree that really isn't doing you or anybody else any good. Uh, so you definitely want to remove it before it got to this stage. Now, if you step back and look at the tree from a distance, uh, often you'll see the yellowing only in part of the tree. Maybe one branch of the tree will, will exhibit this yellowing. And that's because, you know, an insect fed somewhere on that side of the tree and it's taken the time for the disease to spread, for the bacteria to spread throughout the plant. And so uh, this is something you don't normally see with nutritional deficiencies, which tend to be throughout the, you know, throughout the plant fairly evenly. But as it gets worse and worse, the, the canopy also becomes, becomes thinner, and eventually your tree is going to look like this. Uh, and this is really on death's doorstep here. Uh, typically, it takes about five years usually for trees to die, but it uh, can happen quicker. Younger trees uh, die more quickly than older trees. Um, but that's eventually going to happen to any tree because there's no cure for this disease. There's no way to treat the bacteria. Uh, we're, what we're going to try to do is try to keep from spreading it by controlling the insect and not spreading it ourselves through grafting. So if you were to take a piece of, uh, of grafting uh, a branch or a bud from a citrus tree that was infected and you grafted it into one of your trees, uh, you would spread the, tree, the disease that way. In fact, that's how it got here in Southern California in the first place, as I'll show you in a second. So this affects all kinds of citrus, not just the ones we're used to, but other things that are in that family. Uh, some of them are, are grown ornamentally, like the orange jasmine. Uh, Indian curry leaf is one that's grown for, for curry. So the, 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 the insect is throughout the southern states of the United States. I think New Mexico is the only state that doesn't have any, any um, indication of having the insect yet. Uh, but the disease is fortunately a little bit more limited. It's, it was first found in Florida, uh, and since then has spread through um, much of the you know, southern states in pockets, not everywhere. Uh, Georgia looks like it's everywhere, but in fact, that's, that indicates the, where the quarantine is. The insects, act, or the disease rather, has only been found in the southern part of Georgia along the border of Florida. Um, but it is, uh, it, is, it is spreading still. Here in California, the, uh, the blue boundaries there indicate quarantines for the insect. Now, in Southern California, the insect is well established here. They don't expect to, us to be able to control the insect at this point. What we're trying to do now is uh, control the disease only. Southern California, anything above the grapevine, they have found the insect, they do have quarantines up there, but every, anytime they find it, they're able to go up there uh, and spray for the insect and, and get rid of it. So they don't have any permanent populations of the insect up in Northern California, fortunately. And that's where most of our commercial citrus is. LA County, Orange County have hardly any commercial citrus left, but we do still have some in San Bernardino and uh, you know, San Diego and, and Riverside. So we still wanna be vigilant. We zoom on in on the areas that are, have the disease quarantine. It's only LA and Orange County on the left, Riverside and San Bernardino County is on the right. Um, yeah, we just got a notice last week, the quarantine just got expanded. Every, couple, every month or two, we get notices. Uh, this time, it was a fairly small expansion southward in Orange County, below Santa Ana. Uh, this keep continuing. The, uh, the red star there shows you where the first tree was that was infected, and that's in Hacienda Heights. And here's that tree. It's, uh, it was a pomelo tree. The owner had gone to China and brought back some budwood and grafted it into her tree without going through our normal you know, inspections. And so uh, she didn't realize, of course, 
and I don't think most Californians had, were aware of this disease at that time. And so um, the, the CDFA eventually was alerted to this tree and they came out and removed it. And you'll have a, video, a link to a video if you wanna watch that. So I'm in, I live in uh, Diamond Bar. I'm pretty close to the uh, LA uh, County Fairgrounds. And just a few months ago, uh, they found the, uh, an infected tree, several infected trees in nearby San Bernardino County in Montclair. That put the Fairplex pretty close. Uh, we're within five miles now, so we're also so we're part of the quarantine. As soon as anything within five miles of where an infected insect or an infected tree was found are now included in the quarantine. Uh, we've created a map for you guys that's uh, fairly easy. This is an example of it. Uh, and you'll have a link to that. Uh, you just put your address in, and if you're within five miles, you'll see just a yellow circle. And if you're within uh, if you're within two miles, you'll get the, you'll get the, you know you'll be within a red circle. We, we change the message. I guess you see both circles, but we change the message. So we're encouraging people. If you're within the quarantine, you might consider removing your citrus, especially if you're within two miles. Most likely, your trees are already infected. Uh, but you just, we just don't know it yet because it takes uh, one to two years from the time a tree is infected before we can really test it and, and determine it has the bacteria. Uh, the test we use is the same as it's used for COVID-19. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a DNA test uh, to determine that the bacteria is there. And because it spreads slowly, they have to come out and they sample maybe 20 leaves off your tree. And if they just happen to miss it, they'll get a false negative. And that's happened a lot. So we actually know there's a lot more infected trees out there that just haven't been, um, haven't been identified because of the you know, testing inaccuracy. So as a homeowner, what you should be doing is uh, whenever your citrus is growing new leaves, um, some of your citrus may be doing it right now. Much of it probably happened already. Uh, but look for, that, look for that feather flush. Uh, look for damage caused by the psyllid. That'll tell you the psyllid was there even if you don't see it. And of course, look for adults and nymphs and eggs. And, and if you do have it, there's a few things you can do. If you have the psyllid, uh, you can try to uh, keep the population of the uh, psyllids down by growing habitat that's, that helps with beneficial insects like ladybugs and wings and parasitic wasps that'll, that'll control the populations of the psyllid. And I think that's what happened in my, at my house. I went back the, the next day after I found the psyllids in my orange tree and I couldn't find any more, but I did find ladybugs and grace, uh, uh, green lace wings in the area. So I think they just took care of the problem for me. Uh, one of the biggest problems with this is ants. Uh, the ants, because of the honeydew, the ants will protect the psyllids, they harvest the honeydew and, and they protect the psyllids from their natural enemies. So the most important thing you can do as a homeowner is make sure there are no ants uh, in your trees. And you can use the picture there is showing you a, uh, a sticky barrier like Tanglefoot that you can put on the trunk or uh, you can do like ant baits nearby and that'll help a lot. Uh, if, you, if you are gonna go for insecticides, you, we, we normally as master gardeners recommend the milder insecticides like horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps, but they do have to be applied fairly frequently to control the insect. Uh, we're these, uh, the ants, this is showing the ants here actually attacking one of these wasps. This is a Tamarixia wasp that was brought uh, from Pakistan a few years ago by UC Riverside researchers. Uh, Pakistan has had this problem for many, you know, many decades. And so there are natural enemies to that insect, this Tamarixia wasp, that we didn't have here. And so they brought them here, tested them in quarantine, made sure they were safe to release, and they're now releasing them throughout all of the residential areas where the either that already has Wong Long Bing or it's getting close to Wong Long Bing. Uh, so controlling the ants will allow these insects to do their job. Unfortunately, these insects are not a cure. They're not gonna be able to wipe out the entire population of, of ACP. They're gonna help suppress the numbers. They think they've dropped, they've suppressed the population by maybe 70%. You can also try covering your tree and, and you know, that's kind of extreme, but uh, they make these uh, things called triggers in different sizes. You can use uh, uh, a clay uh, called kaolin clay, which is uh, the same material that's used to make porcelain. You suspend it in water, spray it all over your tree, it makes it look really dusty, but it prevents the insect from feeding and laying its eggs. And it's completely safe to be around. 
Uh, nurseries and other places are putting up uh, screen houses that have very fine mesh to keep the uh, psyllid out. Here's a picture of the original Washington Naval Orange that was so important to California citrus history. It's being protected now in its site in Riverside, and this, this tree is almost 150 years old. Uh, and still producing a few oranges. Uh, it used to be thought it was okay to move the fruit around even if you had the disease. Now they say if you're in the area with the disease, don't move the fruit because once in a while the insect will take a ride on the fruit. It doesn't feed on the fruit, uh, so if the fruit has the bacteria, it's not going to uh, pick it up that way. It's a fairly low chance of it happening that way, so most people recommend that you just remove all the leaves and stems from any fruit you pick that's leaving your property and rinse it off good. That, that should be adequate. Yeah, when you're, when you're pruning, uh, please do not take the cuttings and put it into your green waste because that's the way you're moving. If you have the disease or, or the psyllids even, you're moving them uh, off site. So we recommend is you let it, you can leave the cuttings in the ground for a couple of weeks to dry out or you can double bag them and put them into your trash, regular trash. So the UC IPM uh, Integrated Pest Management website has a lot of great stuff on pest management, including uh, uh, things on the Asian citrus psyllid and Wang Long Ding disease. There's some links for those. That's some of the best information out there. If you do think you have the disease, um, please call the CDFA hotline. Uh, they'll come out, uh, they'll look at your tree. If they, if they agree with your visual diagnosis, they'll take samples back up and do a, a test uh, using the PCR method, the DNA test. And at which point, if it's positive, they're going to come out and destroy your tree. They have a mandate to do that, uh, and you're not going to want that tree anyway because it's going to die soon. So here's some alternative fruit tree ideas. You know, we can grow tons of things in Southern California. Uh, when we're doing our workshops in person, we bring out some samples of things a lot of people haven't tried, like uh, loquats and jujubes. So for more information, you can visit our uh, website, our Alternatives to Citrus website. We have links to all these things we're talking about. And if you happen to belong to a gardening club or community garden or any kind of group that'd be interested in a longer workshop on this topic, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, it's usually about an hour long workshop where we go over more details on this. So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Um... There you are. Um, I did see a couple questions go by. Um, one I'm going to throw out there, and then we'll see if uh, the other chat monitors had one. Is there was a question if neem oil would affect the citrus psyllid? Yeah, neem oil is just a it's a contact insecticide. Uh, it's not a residual insecticide, so you have to spray everything and try to make contact with the. It's the same as using horticultural oil or insecticidal soaps. Uh, they don't leave behind residues that are very effective, but uh, they, they can kill any, any soft-bodied insect and, and still as a soft body, they'll, they'll dehydrate them and they, they will take care of them. But you do have to reapply it probably every couple of weeks during the season when the psyllids are active. So having pointed out that it's a contact uh, insecticide, you have to actually spray the critter. Um, and neem oil does have a little bit of a harsh effect on certain plants, especially if you're doing it frequently. Um, it sounds like the insecticidal soaps and the uh, uh, orchard oils are, are probably a better idea. Yeah, you don't want to use those when the temperatures are above 90 degrees. Typically, you can get burn on your plants. Um, uh, if, if, you know, if it is during warmer weather, you might do it uh, in the evening before, just before sunset. It is the, the night to do its job, and then hopefully it'll be, it'll be dried out by the morning in our dry climate. Uh, so that shouldn't cause any real problems. Excellent. All right. Um, chat monitors, did you notice any other questions for Jeff that we need to get up right now? There was one about controlling red ants in the garden. Um, how, just asking, how do I control red ants? Uh, I don't know specifically for red ants if they're if they're more of a, you know, typically ant baits are effective for all kinds of ants, but there are ants that are fat seeking and ants that are sweet seeking. Uh, most of the ones like the, uh, the ones we typically have are the Argentine ants that are black. And those tend to uh, look for sugar. And so they put an ant, you know, a sugary solution with something like boric acid in it that uh, the ants will feed on. 
Uh, I'm not sure specifically for red ants, you know, especially you know, if you're talking about you know the, the red and fortifier ants or things like that. Um, I, I haven't seen them uh, in my plants uh, doing the same thing the black ants are doing, which is protecting the psyllids and the aphids and things and harvesting the honeydew. Yeah, I, I think. Anybody else know about red ants? Well, I was going to say, Jeff, I think you, you hit it on the nose that uh, there are fat seeking and sweet seeking, and the sweet seeking ants are the ones that manage the aphids that manage the psyllids in order to um, milk them literally for the honeydew that they give off. Um, and then the honeydew has a secondary effect of causing uh, a fungus to grow in, in this sugar. Yeah, you can, if you have a lot of the, the adults don't encapsulate their honeydew. And so they end up making a, a mess on the leaves and, and then that attracts a sooty mold. Right. So, um, and then the red ants are generally, in my experience, uh, more the fat seeking, and you're not going to find them uh, in your citrus trees. But we can um, definitely have that question up on the um, on the Master Gardener group page, and we can track down some IPM information for you about those fat seeking uh, red ants. Cool. Um, we have a couple more citrus questions coming by, but we need to do our next presentation, and then we'll come back at the end and try to pick up some more questions for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, but we like to try to end the main uh, workshop on time. Uh, coming up very next, we have uh, Master Gardener Daniela Rovetta, uh, who will be talking to us about compost. I like to call it um, rotting plants for fun and fertilizer, even though that's technically not what's going on. Uh, Daniela, are you ready to roll? Good Excellent. Good morning, uh, Roger, can you remember to give me the power to share the screen as well? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is um, Daniela. I'm Master Gardener in Santa Monica. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, composting. So composting um, is a um, process and a lot of people are intimidated by it. But I'm going to try to give you a quick and easy basic guide on how to do it. So first of all, we can ask ourselves, why do we want to compost? Well, compost for uh, experienced gardeners is like spreading gold uh, in your, on your garden because it can fix, this all, can fix all kinds of problems. It can fix problems with soil. If your soil is clay and compacted, you add compost, you make it better. If it's sandy, it doesn't retain, you add compost, it will retain more water. Um, also, if you have issues with uh, diseases or pest attacks, usually compost in the soil boosts the plant's immune system and makes them more resistant to disease and pest attacks. It also fixes soil erosion because it adds organic matter to the soil and the um, topsoil doesn't um, Get, doesn't get removed by rain uh, or wind. Not to mention the environmental benefits. So every time you throw any organic matter in your uh, regular trash, it will go into the landfill. Uh, whereas if you put it in your compost bin, it will turn into an amazing substance to enrich the soil and benefit the health of the planet. So, um, we can call it organic trash, anything that you throw away that's organic matter. Uh, if it, when it's composted, and it's composted thanks to um, microorganisms and some bugs that we call decomposers, it will be transformed eventually into what we call humus, which is the substance that you get after the decomposition process is completely finished. And that's the um, sort of like the black gold we add to our garden. Um, a lot of people tell me and tell us master gardeners that they try to compost, but they fail, it dries up, nothing happens. So um, I'm gonna give you four basic ingredients for successful composting. One is volume. So you cannot make a little tiny compost pile. It has to be large enough for a lot of uh, activity, decomposing activity at the same time. So you want your compost bin to be at least three, four, three feet by three. 
uh, and about three feet tall as well. So a big area. Ventilation. You need uh, air into your compost pile. So the sides of your compost bin need to have some holes or gaps uh, to allow air to enter. You also will need to turn it uh, occasionally to let air uh, go inside the, the middle of the pile. You need moisture. You cannot let that pile dry up or the decomposition process will stop. So you don't want to drench it, it doesn't need to be wet, it has to be moist at all times, however. So get your hose, especially on a hot day, give it a little spray. And finally, you need to have the correct balance between carbon-rich materials, that's the C, and nitrogen-rich materials, that's the N. Uh, that's where people start getting confused uh, and alarmed, uh, but we have a solution for that. First of all, let's look at um, different examples of compost bins. Uh, you can see the double one, um, uh, the, the bigger picture. The double compost bin is useful if you want to have two piles going simultaneously, but uh, that are at different stages of uh, composting. So you can add new materials on one side as the other side is maturing and getting ready to be um, gathered and spread in the garden. The one, uh, the tumbler that you see up top is also an option. It is easier to turn your pile because you have that nifty handle to turn and it will do it for you. It has some drawbacks, uh, I find, uh, because especially in hot areas in the summer, it overheats the pile inside and there doesn't uh, allow for much air to enter the pile. So it is uh, good for, for some reasons, but not so good for others. The one at the bottom, this, this cylinder, it's probably the cheapest way and easier. You can get that material in a hardware store, uh, make a cylinder out of it, tie it with um, a, a wire, and there you get your compost pile. So a lot of people buy them, uh, but as you can see, you can do it yourself, both the one, uh, the double one made with, um, uh, wood slats is easy to make even with scrap wood and the one the cylinder again it's cheap material you to, you can make it at home by yourself and here my powerpoint has stopped so i uh roger can you help me here Make sure you have clicked on the actual screen. It sounds like you're clicking on a screen that is not your uh, PowerPoint. Otherwise, I'm gonna um, try to. Um, is it uh, showing now? Hold on. Uh, yes. Here, I can put it up for you. No, uh, let me try again and see if it works. Um, okay. Should just be able to click present. Uh, no, it, unfortunately, it didn't. all right. Um, let me try again. Is that working? Well, we can see the slide, but it's not presenting. So, okay, let me try one more thing. All right, I'm going to go ahead and oh. does it work now? Well, it's there, but you're at the beginning. Okay, so let me go. Um, unfortunately, I have to go one at a time. So. Sometimes the PowerPoint just gets um, stops halfway through. Okay. All right. How do you start a compost pile? Uh, there are many ways you can do it. Um, I'm going to suggest the layering method. That's a um, rule of thumb way to balance correctly your brown materials, the carbon materials, and your uh, green materials. So you just uh, um, 
start with one layer of brown material, three to five inches high, uh, and then you add a layer of green materials, another three to five inches high, and then you keep alternating until you reach a height of about two, three feet. Now, we have to figure out what the materials rich in carbon are. So the most plentiful for you to find the garden is dead leaves. So dead leaves are rich in carbon. Uh, another picture there is corn stalks, hay, shredded newspaper, also cut in small pieces, sawdust. These are all carbon rich materials. Materials rich in nitrogen, grass clippings, your kitchen waste. It could be eggs, eggshells, carrot peels, potato peels, bananas, fruit, any type. Uh, it could be green leaves. It could be uh, coffee grounds, tea leaves. All these are excellent choices for green materials in your compost pile. Uh, how do you know if you're doing it right? So in phase one, your compost pile will probably look like a mess of stuff that you have thrown into your bin. But uh, eventually, after three, four, five days, it should settle. It will uh, decrease in volume because a lot of air uh, and water will evaporate. So it will start looking like a more compact pile. After about three days, it should start getting warm. So if you put your hand inside the pile, you should feel it, you should feel warmth in there. That tells you that, it's, uh, that you're doing it right. Phase two, well, that your pile is gonna be, gonna start to show some finished product. So something that will look like a rich soil, but some leaves and twigs may still be whole. That means that you're close, but you're not quite done. And at the very end of the process, what you're gonna be left with is what we call humus. So it is completely decomposed material. It will look to you like very soft, uh, moist, the rich soil. And I have the same problem again. Okay, materials to avoid. You do not want to put any feces in your compost pile. Human, dog, cat, birds, um, that can attract uh, rodents and other pests that you do not want there. Avoid uh, diseased plants. As you can see, this rusty leaf, because the, the uh, spores of fungi uh, and other like, eggs of insects can live in your compost pile. And then when you spread it uh, around your garden, you're going to spread the diseases all over again. You do not want to add things that are too hard to decompose that will take years to decompose. For example, thick branches or uh, peach pits or walnut shells, that kind of stuff. You don't want to add um, any food that has animal fats. So do not put there your half-eaten steak or hamburger, anything that uh, is greasy, butter, cheese, all, all that kind of stuff. Again, it does decompose but it will attract all the bad pests you do not want in your compost pile. Finally, do not add pernicious weeds. Weeds are okay to add. I do add them to my compost pile uh, because when, especially when the pile gets warm, it will kill the seeds of any type of uh, weed. But the very bad weeds like nutsedge, Bermuda grass, crabgrass, it's best not to add. Uh, how do you know you're doing it right? Well, your pile should not smell bad. 
it should be hot or at least warm in the middle, at least in the first two to two, three weeks. It should be moist, but not wet. If all of this happens, you're on the right path. Now, everybody asks, how long does it take? Well, it can take any time between three weeks and two years, but it really depends on how you do it. So if you want to have a quick composting process, you need to cut all your materials into small pieces. The smaller they are, the faster the decomposers will eat them and process them. You want to turn your pile often because the more oxygen goes into the pile, the more your uh, microorganisms will work for you. And don't add new material. So you can add new material as time goes on, but uh, every time you do it, you slow the process. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, just know that sooner or later it will work because everything, any organic matter that come, that drops on the ground eventually disappears because the decomposers will eat it. And I am, I think, done with that. And I can take questions if there are any. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. Can you um, stop your screen share so we can see you? Yes. All right. There we go. We do have a couple of questions out there. And uh, chat monitors, if you get ready to, to present those, I'd appreciate it. I, I want to share something real quick that um, instead of sticking your hand down in the messy old compost, this is my favorite toy. Um, I bought this for, oh, 20 bucks on Amazon. It's a thermometer, and it's a cool thermometer. And I'm going to take just two minutes and share that with you because it shows you the temperatures uh, of different stages of composting. And a compost pile can get really hot it can steam. Um, so you have to be a little careful when you shove your hand down in a good compost pile because it can be um, a little over warm. But it's, it's a great toy and I, I love it and it's a way to prove to yourself that your compost pile is really doing its thing. So uh, chat folks, do you have some questions for Daniela? I saw a couple go by. There were a couple about controlling flies in the compost pile. Um, well, I usually add uh, on top of my compost pile always a layer of uh, dry material, like dead leaves, something that is not, has not been sprayed, especially if I put my uh, kitchen waste that can attract flies. But if you bury it deep into your pile, you usually take care of the flies. So you, one thing you can do if you want to add it, just make a hole in the middle of the pile deep put all your kitchen waste there and then cover it back up with dry material. That should take care of it. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to note that one of the questions actually mentioned the flies, but also mosquitoes. And if you've got mosquitoes in a compost pile, it has way too much water uh, because there's nothing in a compost pile that a mosquito is typically going to want. It wants live bodies for warm blood or um, a nice wet place to, to lay eggs. Um, all right, were there uh, some other co composting questions that we saw go, go by? Uh, one, one question I see is any source recommendation for other carbon if I don't have much uh, dead plant material in the yard? Oh, any carbon? Well, you can always go get some sawdust uh, at a you know, carpenter or a hardwood store, uh, hay in sometimes, um, you can get hay. Um, that, that's interesting. Get... Hay is a fun one because uh, the straw tends to take a long time to break down, but it's, but it's got a lot of good carbon. I've used um, shredded newspapers, but making sure that just the black and white kind, not the weird color inks, uh, yeah. when I was short on, on dead dry leaves because I happened to be up on my raking. So uh, in general, yeah. when the newspaper breaks down, modern inks are not full of uh, the deleterious chemicals that they were once upon a time. They're, they're pretty, uh, pretty aware of that. But if you happen to find a, a hipster newspaper that prints with soy ink, so much the better. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, cardboard actually works quite well. The problem is that it's, it's a process to cut in small pieces. I usually 
um, put it in water for overnight so the cardboard is easier to shred and then you add it to the to the pile and that usually works quite well there you go yeah the, the breaking down process changes a lot of things all right do we see any other questions that are that are good to for uh, the compost segment there, there was someone early in the presentation who had mentioned they got a tumbling composter and were co was concerned uh, about how to start using it, was wondering about putting in soil for starting like we would if we were doing a just a standing compost pile. So how to start using this new tumbling composter. I would use it the same way you would uh, any other compost pile. You just put in the, the right balance between carbon and nitrogen. I usually don't even add um, soil to my compost pile. One thing that can work actually is manure. So if you add a little chicken manure or even horse manure, uh, that's a, a nitrogen rich um, material that can give it a good start to your pile. And the good news there is if you don't have chickens or horses, uh, you can buy a bag for a buck or two. Uh, it's, a, it's been uh, sterilized enough that it's not going to come with disease processes, but it is still super nitrogen and a, a couple of handfuls in a compost pile. And you're going to need to fill it with brown to, uh, to overcome that. Um, I have seen some of those tumbler types that have instructions that require special um, uh, additives in order to get the uh, bacteria going. Because they're not in contact with the ground, they're not in contact with uh, the decomposers that come in naturally. So you might want to uh, read the instructions on the particular tumbler. If it's not open to infiltration from the outside or has oxygen passing, uh, there may be some special steps to take for that one. Awesome. All right. Uh, any other questions that we see right now? We are going to have a question and answer section at the end um, once we wrap up the, the main uh, workshop. Yes, there's one about, um, she asks, my compost is in the shade. Is it necessary to move it into the sun? No, absolutely not. And actually, it's not a bad idea to keep it in the shade, especially if you live in a hot area, because um, if it's in the sun, in the summer, it can dry up a lot quick, quicker, and uh, you want to keep it so you, uh, moist, so you have to add a lot of water to keep it moist. So shade is good yeah actually that's an important point the heat doesn't come from putting the compost in the sun the heat is generated by the action of decomposition the material itself gets hot and i've seen compost piles on cold days in february steaming uh, because they were so much warmer than the surrounding air awesome all right there's a whole bunch more questions but i think we're going to wrap up officially uh, we'll count to five and then we'll be on for uh, a more casual version of the question and answer period. Um, and we'll go for about five or 10 minutes with that. Um, if you'd like to see the workshop again or see it without all the glitches, you can find that online at the Master Gardener, LA County Master Gardener Group uh, on Facebook. And you do not have to be a member to find it. Uh, if you search on Garden in Place, the videos of past workshops and this current one are also or will be on YouTube. And so you can find Garden in Place on YouTube and that's where we are. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming to join us. Thank you presenters for, for helping us out here. And uh, officially, that's it for us. We'll see you in about five seconds to answer your question. Bye now. And three, two, one. Hey, we're back. Um, hey, look, only two people left. Uh-oh. So um, we are looking over uh, some of the questions. And one of the exchanges that happened in the question part uh, was about how to deal with the ant problem. And there was a big discussion about boric acid.
And I would like for the folks that were having that conversation possibly to pop up and 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 talk to us about it uh, as far as the Master Gardeners. Um, Master Gardeners, uh, let's see, Marty was in on that conversation. Um, does anybody else remember that conversation? I, I did. Okay, excellent. Okay, so we have a huge ant problem with, and we have several different varieties of ants because we live in the desert. So we keep um, a lumen of borax and sugar mixed up. It's a tablespoon of borax, a tablespoon of sugar, and it's the large mason jar, so it's about four um, cups of water. Um, you just mix it up, you label it with what it is so you don't mistake it for moonshine or whatever else you would keep in a, um, a jar. And for inside, we just soak a cotton ball, put the cotton ball um, where we see the ants coming in. It does take a couple of days. For outdoors, um, I usually don't kill ants outside. I mean, that's just, not, that's my personal preference. But if you're going to, and I've, I've done it before because it was near a pool and I didn't want them by the pool, just pour some near the hole and they'll feed on it. And then a couple of days later, they'll find someplace else to live. Um, I'm sure Daniela has more to add. Actually, no, I do exactly the same thing and it works for me. Uh, but I do not have a problem outdoors, except uh, if you have a problem on a tree, then there is a, uh, a remedy that I would um, suggest because if you see ants on a fruit tree, that means that you have a pest infestation of some kind because ants feed on the eggs and larvae of pests and carry the, the pests around the eggs so, and defend them from beneficial predators. So if you have ants on a tree, the best thing to do is tangle foot, which is like a sticky material, a band that you um, attach at the base of the trunk of the tree. And ants, so it's a basically a barrier. Ants cannot go in and out of the tree. The ones that are on the tree will eventually die. The, the ones who try to, to climb the tree will be able to. And that is, I pro probably the remedy number one to get rid of pests on a fruit tree. Excellent. And I will note that there was a link put up uh, a few links back for uh, uh, how to deal with ants using integrated pest management from the UC uh, website, which probably has a lot more detail and even tells how to go to the nuclear option if you feel you need to get in there and, and use something serious and chemical to, uh, to handle that. Um, although we like to leave it to the, the folks at the main office to uh, give instructions on that sort of thing. All right, do we uh, see any others that we need to get back to for questions for today? I am scrolling through and I'm not immediately Actually, I'll, I'll address, I'll address the chat things that I was talking to somebody about. They were asking if anybody had a chipper shredder that they could borrow and that obviously works exceptionally well but sometimes you don't have access to all of the cool bells and whistles and when i enter community garden what we would do is we would have the gardeners run over the compost the big pieces of compost with their lawnmower and then we'd just throw them back in the compost bin i mean most people have some sort of access to a lawnmower and although that isn't probably the best way to do it um, we were finding in our community garden that people were not breaking down their compost and they were throwing really large pieces of vegetation in there. So um, that was our solution there. I don't know if that's gonna help anybody else out, but it works. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting one. Cause obviously you're talking about green waste though, not wood and wood chips, even though they're chipped are not gonna be a good choice for compost because they're just gonna take forever to decompose. They will, but they'll take forever. Yes, Daniela. Uh, my yeah, my issue with, with the, it wasn't so much greenwood, it was like, like corn stalks and like giant weeds. And like, it was, it was really, it was green material, but you gotta, you gotta like, you gotta see what it looks like when you run over even um, branches and stuff with the lawnmower three or four times, the pieces are like this big, they're real. Excellent. All right. And uh, Daniela, did you have something to add to that? 
Uh, not, not to that, but I see a few more questions on composting in okay. the chat. Um, somebody asked about banana and citrus peels. Should they go in the compost? Yes. Uh, I do not put bananas, definitely yes. Better if you cut them in smaller pieces. Uh, but I do not put a lot of citrus because citrus can stop, it's an antibacterial, so it can stop a little bit the decomposition process. So do not go overboard with the citrus peels. Um, then another question about adding ashes. And the answer is yes, you can add ash. It's a sea material, uh, ashes from your uh, fireplace. And finally, um, is there another way to compost? Well, yes, uh, you can do vermiculture. So that's another way that's compost too. Uh, and there was a presentation that I think is available to everybody on the website, on the Facebook. Uh, page. Um, there's also what we call anaerobic composting, which means that it's done in a sealed container. So you put all your scraps in a, say, bucket, you close it tight and you let it stand there without opening because it will smell horribly. Um, and you let it putrefy and uh, it will turn into compost eventually. I have never done it, honestly. Um, because I prefer the aerobic process, but it can be done. Awesome. Thank you. I will point out too, if you put too much ash and too much water, you'll wind up with a um, uh, something you don't want to put on your plant. So ash is always a very kind of a, a small amount sort of a sort of thing. Um, two quick more questions have come up and I want to throw them out there. One is I have a fluffy pest. That sounds like a pet. I have a fluffy pest on my citrus trees that I've seen. They're asking if it's a woolly aphid. Um, it's hard to tell without a picture, of course, but I'm going to bet it is a, um, uh, a woolly scale. Uh, scale insect attaches itself to the, the side of the stem and sucks juices out of the stem. And they have some that uh, look like little puff balls um, that uh, you can find up on the UCA ANR. And that's a trick. If you have a question and you're not getting an answer here, you're not getting an answer on the web page that you like, and you want to do some research, put in your question. I have woolly bugs on my citrus, and then put in UC ANR after it, and you'll get the science. That'll be the first thing that comes up in your Google search. So at the end of your question, put UC ANR and it will bring you up to the um, cooperative extension information that's available on it. Awesome. I'll, I'll add to that, Roger. Uh, one of the, a common pest of citrus that looks like that, you have to see a picture like Roger was saying to be sure to identify it. Uh, but there's one, a one called the cottony cushion scale. Uh, that, that actually was a huge pest of citrus and was wiping out Southern California citrus like 100 years ago. And it was one of the first occasions when they actually went to another country and brought back uh, a, a, an insect that specialized on it called the Vidalia beetle. And it's, it's the ladybug, basically. And now we have those here, and they pretty much control it. So it doesn't usually get out of, out of control. You might find little bits here and there, uh, but it's not likely to threaten your tree. And, and Jeff, I don't know what I was thinking, but that's exactly the critter I was talking about. I just read woolly aphids and turned them into <laughs> woolly scale. So I apologize. You've given the right information. Awesome. All right, um, we do need to wrap this one up, I'm afraid, because we have another um, presentation to start for a private group in about three minutes. So um, I wanna thank everybody again. If you go off to the Facebook page, we do have a um, place where you can ask questions there um, and also a place where you can link into this workshop once it's up and um, all of the others. All right, and the video that was hard to see will be both in the workshop uh, and uh, up separately um, so you can just watch it because it was actually really neat with its narration. Um, I got to see it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great Tuesday. Uh, you have two days or three days to think about what you're going to do in the garden this weekend. And uh, it's supposed to be nice and warm, so it'll be a great day to get outside. Bye, guys. <laughs>